Check. Nathan, you still getting this at the camera? Check, check, check.
Okay, everybody here, are you ready to start? Great. Uh, that didn't sound very good. Can you say it again? Great, great. And real quick, I hear an echo here. So um, what is the proper thing sh that I should do? Uh, Uh, I have no control over that because um, it's HDMI. So let's see what I can do here. Um, I am muted there. Uh, you're not hearing it here. Okay. Um, okay. Um, it just is a little distracting for the people who are talking. Let's see what I can do here. Uh, I don't want to do that. Leave that. Okay. Remember, we're astronomers. We're not a you know full-fledged production company here, uh, and we have people, amazing AV people, that just pulled this together. Let's see what I can do here. Okay. So uh, panelists, you'll have a little bit of an echo to, to deal with. This is showbiz, okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, let's try this again. Are you ready? Yes, okay, great. And people at home, all right, coming to us uh, wherever you are. I hope you're ready as well. Okay, it's, it's my pleasure to introduce our co-MCs. And uh, let me get the screen going. Oh, uh, but I did the... In Incorrectly, I need to share my screen first. And then, oh, share screen, and that's optimized. Great. Wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce our co MCs for the evening uh, graduate students Bhagya Subrian and Danielle Dickinson. Let's give them a warm hand. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the James Webb Space Telescope First Light Party. We are excited to have everyone here this evening. We have a great evening ahead of us celebrating the first images from the James Webb Space Telescope here at Purdue University. My name is Bhagya Subrayan. I'm a PhD candidate from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Purdue. My research primarily focuses on understanding the origins and physics behind exploding stars. And my name is Danielle Dickinson, and I use she, they pronouns. I'm a second year student, um, graduate student here in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Purdue. My research focuses on the final evolution of very massive stars and their inevitable dramatic and eruptive stellar death. This is really an exciting time to be an astrophysicist. I was blown away by the first James Webb tele Space Telescope images. What about you? How are you feeling, Daniel? All I can think about the data right now is Wow, I can't wait for what science comes out of this amazing telescope. We really are in a golden age of astronomy. <laughs> that is really exciting. So for some background here, the James Webb Space Telescope was launched in December 2021 on an Ariane 5 rocket and was perfectly parked at the second Lagrange point in January this year. As of July, the JWST or the James Webb Space Telescope is intended to succeed the Hubble Space Telescope as NASA's flagship mission in astrophysics. The first deep field image from Webb Telescope was released by President Joe Biden to the public through a press conference Monday this week. Following the release of JWST's deep field image, NASA released a series of spectacular images and the first exoplanet spectra was taken by the extraordinary Webb instruments. We are gathered here today in the cradle of astronauts to dive into these uh, images. And I just want to say that at Purdue, we're committed to fostering a culture of inclusion as outlined by the College of Sciences commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, we pledge to continue our work to create a just, equitable, and safe environment for everyone in our College of Science community. To make this evening special, we are joined in person and remotely by an amazing panel of expert scientists and speakers from the Department of Physics and Astronomy here at Purdue University and other universities around the United States. They will provide us with expert insights into the first light images of the James Webb Space Telescope. 
We have here with us today, Professor Dan Milosavljevic from Purdue University, Kate Gassaway from Purdue, Dr. Ori Fox virtually from the Space Telescope Science Institute, Dr. Elizabeth Newton virtually from Dartmouth College, Colin Hamill from Purdue University, Dr. Nathan Smith virtually from the University of Arizona, Dr. Rodolfo Montez Jr. from Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, uh, Dr. Patrick Kelly from the University of Minnesota, and Dr. Kian Su Lee from Purdue. That is a stellar panel. Now we'll welcome our first speaker. It is our pleasure to introduce and welcome the best and coolest advisor, Professor Danny Milsalwich. Dan is an assistant professor of physics and astronomy at Purdue University College of Science. Dan is also a principal investigator of Cycle 1 JWST program for investing supernova remnant Cassiopeia A. He is more well known for his iconic reactions to the launch of James Webb Space Telescope. Welcome, Dan. The floor is for you. So, Dan, what can we expect from the James Webb Space Telescope? The floor is yours. All right, I already have like a tough act to follow. That was an amazing introduction to tonight. And I hope I can rise to that level of uh, excitement and enthusiasm that uh, Danielle and Bugya have started for us. So my role this evening is to just give you a sense of uh, what, what the first images represent, the kind of science that Webb hopes to achieve. And to give us a little bit more context, perhaps more than what the original press release and what a lot of the press that you'll be reading over the, the coming weeks gets into. A little bit more about the hallmarks behind the web images and uh, what you'll notice about them being different compared to other data sets you may have seen. And I'm going to ask real quick, maybe a little bit dimming of the lights at this point, because there's going to be some real vivid images that uh, we want to share in all their crisp glory. So first, uh, I've just I, I borrowed some of these uh, stock uh, slides that have been pr provided by NASA about the uh, science goals. That's yes, that's fine. Science goals of the web. One is the fact that web was it, one of its true purposes is to look back as far into the universe as possible. Here is an image taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And that galaxy highlighted here is about 13.4 uh, billion light years away. And as the expression uh, leads you to believe, yes, indeed, it's taken light 13.4 billion years to arrive from there to here. That's a pretty distant location, but we want to be able to probe even further. So Webb is designed to go hundreds of millions of years further into the history of the universe. And why is that important? I like to place it in context with trying to understand the origins of something. Say yourself. Uh, I went home not too long ago and I found an old chapter book that my family had kept of me. Uh, and year by year, uh, things were chronicled, some major milestones. Say my old kindergarten report card, or uh, you know, a, a great uh, a report that I'd submitted or a really weird journal that I had kept. Um, but you know, try to imagine somebody ripping out the first few years of that chapter book. There's a lot of important developmental stuff that happened in those years. So with Webb, we'll be able to push back into those early epochs to the time when the first galaxies were forming with the first stars. On that uh, note of a chapter book, one of the other missions is attempting to understand the evolutions of galaxies. Now, we are mere humans, right? And our lifetimes of, of war are 100 years, certainly don't match the uh, lifetimes of, of galaxies, can be billions of years, right? So how do we investigate this thing? Well. Although we can't watch a single galaxy evolve with time, we can look at many, many, many examples of galaxies at kind of snapshots of their evolution. And then if we're clever, we can kind of put them together in a smart way 
and create a flip book of evolution of galaxies. That's another one of the uh, scientific purposes of WET. Next, black holes. And note, this is an illustration. I'll say that up front. Okay? Uh, one thing that WET will be able to do, it won't be imaging the black hole. Okay? Remember, it's black. It doesn't allow light to escape. But in fact, we can uh, investigate the black hole by looking at its influence around its environment. And there's many possible science uh, opportunities, one being mapping out the gas dynamics around the black hole. Right? We'll discuss more about spectroscopy, but measuring the velocity flows, the temperatures, the kinematics, the chemical abundances of the uh, surrounding gas to give more insight into the black hole itself. And actually, we believe that just about every uh, galaxy has a supermassive black hole at its center. And it's currently um, an active area investigation to understand how that black hole can affect the evolution of the galaxy. Another thing that Webb will do is help us understand how stars form, live, and die. Now, as uh, uh, morbid as it sounds, most of my research is understanding how stars die. And I perform kind of uh, autopsies of stellar death, trying to understand how the debris has been arranged in its cer a certain way, to understand the type of star that was there beforehand. Webb will be a very powerful tool to do this. But another thing, because it operates in the infrared light regime, and by the way, this is comparing a Hubble image to a visible light. And this is what we would say is the near infrared or the shorter region of the infrared. Webb goes out to longer regions, what we call the mid infrared. But notice the difference between these two images of the same region of the Carina Nebula. Do you see how more stars pop out in the infrared light as opposed to the visible light. That's because the universe can be actually a dirty place. There can be dust and gas that obscures our ability to see the stars behind it. The infrared light largely gets around that. So the longer wavelengths that we go, the easier it is to penetrate into that gas. And that's actually critical if we want to understand how stars form. Stars form in dense molecular clouds, so regions where there's a lot of gas and dust. So to see inside, one needs to go to longer wavelengths. Another thing that Webb is powerful at is detecting uh, planets around other stars. Let me give you some understanding of what we're looking at. Uh, in the center is a star, but it's been masked by an occultation disk. We call it also a coronagraph. Similar to when you're driving or what the case may be and the blinding sun is in your way, you're gonna put your hand in front of it so you can see where you're going, right? This disc is doing the same thing, obscuring the bright star so that we have an opportunity to ping out these sources, which are planets orbiting around the sun. Now, planets are relatively cool, and I don't mean hip, I mean temperature cool compared to stars. Okay? and cooler temperatures emit more in the infrared. So Webb is supremely designed, right? It, 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 its sensitivity is well-tuned to detecting uh, the emission from exoplanets. On that point of exoplanets, uh, it's also been designed to look for the spectroscopic signatures that may indicate life. It's a little bit of a mouthful. Let me make sure everybody understands. This is a plot showing wavelength and light block. This is actually an annoying graph to me. I, if, if I were at NASA, I'd tell them, hey, flip it around. It's a little bit more easier to understand. Uh, a spectrum, similar to the way if you've ever watched uh, light pass through a prism or maybe a glass of water, you see the white light uh, of the sun being dispersed into its various constituent colors. A similar thing can happen on web where we pass it through some kind of dispersive element and that light from the system gets split up and we're able to look for uh, signatures 
of chemicals. Uh, here we see uh, gases of uh, molecules. We have ozone, carbon monoxide, and water. Right? And all things considered, by looking at the relative intensities of these features and their placement, we can figure out which gases are associated with the absorption features. We'll hear more about that in a later presentation. A little bit more about uh, visible versus infrared light. And this is consistent with me trying to explain to you, you know, why does it look like that when we see these web images? So here's an image of meerkats in the visible light, how adorable they are, and then the infrared uh, regime. Uh, maybe some people are familiar with uh, night vision goggles. Why do we see it like this? This is now reflecting emission at infrared light, uh, and that's associated with the temperature of the me meerkats. Now, the meerkats, they have a high metabolism, right? They got they're really active people, so they active animals, so they have uh, an emission that's strong in uh, infrared light. Now, let's look at the freshwater co crocodile. We still see some evidence of uh, infrared light coming from it, but it doesn't emit as strongly. And for those who are clever, look at this gradient scale. So the hottest temperatures are represented with a closer to white, whereas the lower temperatures closer towards a dark red or black. So you need to remember that because web operates at longer wavelengths, infrared, the types of emission that it's sensitive to is going to be different than what you're seeing in the optical. That is part of what's going to make uh, web different from HST. Uh, here again is that example that I, I showed earlier, right? By uh, highlighting, by going into the infrared, we're sensitive to different emissions. And simultaneously, we can go through, it's easier to look through opaque gas. Placing things in context, here's the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So light can have uh, a, a large range of, of wavelengths, very short wavelengths, high energy gamma rays to very long wavelengths, radio low energy. So the visible region, what we see is a very narrow slice and the infrared moves outward. You can see this is where web is fine tuned for. Another thing. Why is Webb going to look different from Hubble? Well, size is certainly different between the, 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 the two facilities. Hubble is at a 2.4 meters, and Webb is at 6.5. I wonder why they put 6.6 .6 in this figure. And by the way, I am Canadian, and Canadians like the rest of the world use metric units. Okay, I don't have it in feet. I apologize. So one, the size. This... A, a, a telescope mirror is a light bucket. And the larger light bucket you have, the more photons you can capture, the more sensitive you are to faint emission. So that's one thing that Webb definitely has as an advantage over Hubble. And we're gonna see this image uh, uh, later in the, in the presentation, and it'll be highlighting how we are much more sensitive to fainter emission. There's another thing to it though, right? Remember that I said earlier, Webb is designed to look into the early universe. And those galaxies that are so far away, right, they've had their light expanded, okay, stretched out into the infrared from the time of emission. And so because that light has been ex extended out into the uh, infrared wavelength regimes, there's more emission that we can potentially see from the distant universe. Oh, one more thing. You may notice. Okay, here's a, one of the most striking images of Hubble, that the Hubble diffraction pattern, stars have this kind of uh, four pattern diffraction spikes. Okay? Uh, when you look at it, you'll see that Webb has this kind of killer snowflake look to it. Okay? These six diffraction uh, uh, spikes, and there's a little bit more structure to it. And that is a reflection, and sorry, I'm nerding out here, but I'm fascinated by these things. And this is something that I, I teach in my, uh, uh, Astro 567 class, but it's a reflection of the aperture. So for instance, uh, if I have a completely circular aperture, I'm going to have this kind of uh, you know, distribution, uh, source distribution diffused out, right? But
But by changing that circle into a hexagon, this is the resulting uh, pattern that I get. Now, let's make this even more like a uh, web where we have these uh, patterned out regions that are associated with the 18 individual hexagonal mirrors. You can see the increasing levels of complexity in the uh, light profile. And then finally, when you include the struts, the supports that hold the, the secondary mirror, we have this elaborate uh, uh, um, point spread function, the, the distribution of light. And notice, I added this for context too, each of these struts adds a pattern perpendicular. So you see we have, if, if in this design with a single strut here, we have a pattern that's perpendicular. If you have two, it, do, it, it adds to the intensity. When you have a left, you know, a, a vertical, and, 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 and vertical and horizontal, then we have these two contributing. All right, another thing. Let's look a little bit, and we're going to see these images later. This is all a teaser trailer leading up to what we see. Here's the Southern Ring Nebula. Uh, credit here to Danielle, who worked into the late night uh, grabbing data to make the best comparisons between the objects. Okay. And you know what I'm going to do? Can I? Uh, no, I can't do this. Okay, I'm, I'm not smart enough to, to put it even lower. But anyway, uh, let's... She made this GIF. So comparing, and by the way, so we have Webb, we have HST, and we have Spitzer. And Spitzer, in some ways, is a better comparison because it does operate in the infrared. However, it's a much smaller aperture, less than a meter in size. Yeah, just go all the way down, I think. If people want to sleep, let them sleep. But I'm going to try and hold their attention, okay? That, I think, does a little the images a little bit more justice, okay? Thank you, Bunny. Yeah, that's fine. Just leave it. No, no, I leave it, uh, I would leave it, yeah, down. Yeah, that's right, okay? We're having a, a movie-like setting here, right? That's what I'm aiming for. Okay, so now, so this is Danielle's handiwork, making an animated GIF between the, the images, okay? So we have Spitzer, we have Hubble, and then we have James Webb. And I can't wait to hear from Rodolfo, who uh, specializes in planetary nebula, to understand what all this beautiful structure is that we're seeing around it. Okay. So we have many things that are contributing to the, the differences in the images. Right? One is a matter of light gathering ability. Another is a matter of resolution. Another is visible versus infrared. All these things contribute to uh, differences in the images that we see from web versus uh, previous uh, missions. And here's a final one I'll show. We have uh, Hubble versus Webb versus Spitzer. This one I find very striking. There's Hubble. And maybe I gotta do this, yes. James Webb and Spitzer you can see how much difference there is in resolution. Great. Oh, uh, for, for grins, uh, just this morning, I had a contribution from uh, friends and collaborators uh, who operate, uh, I don't like saying amateur, let's call them volunteer astronomers. You know, they have day jobs, but then in the evening, they love to take images with their backyard telescopes. This is the James Webb Space Telescope image of uh, the, the Carina Nebula that we'll look at later. But this is his from his 14-inch uh, telescope. And you know, is it worth $10 billion? <laughs> well, it's not bad from the backyard, right? And by the way, somebody asked me, I was at Qantas Club uh, giving a presentation, does this kill amateur astronomy? Never. There is no substitute for the gratification of taking your own images with, when, you're, when you're handling your own telescope. Okay. All right. Ah, by the way, I had to show that my, my wife, Lindsay, said, Dan, you have to show this. Okay? I'm not with the meme culture, but the, like, this one does make sense to me. Because I actually relate it to the time when I first got my prescription glasses and I put them on. And I remember it was a snowy day. And for me, it was seeing the snow. 
It's like, oh my gosh, that's what it looks like. And then I remember looking at signs and I saw colors in new ways. I said, oh my gosh, that's what the rest of the world sees, right? So this is kind of what's happening with Webb versus Hubble. Okay? And it's funny when we look at the higher resolution and then tie back to lower resolution, you can see faint whispers of what is obvious in the web in the Hubble, but it's not strong enough to be convincing, right? To really have confidence in interpreting these data, we need a strong signal and sharp resolution in, in Spider-Man. Okay, so uh, one final thing that I wanna highlight, and then I'm gonna pivot to the speakers, is uh, in addition to web presenting images uh, that are different from, from previous missions, also realize that there's a kind of artistic license behind how the images are presented. Yeah. They don't take color images of regions. Astronomers will take uh, images in monochromatic uh, filters yeah, and then combine those to make a composite color image. In, in the simplest case, it'd be a red, green, blue. Yeah. And in the optical, that's kind of easy. You know, our eyes, they have rods and cones, these cells that are uh, photoreceptors. And the, the, the cones, there's three different cones that are sensitive to three different types of light, blue, green, and red. Okay? And you can use uh, CCDs or CMOS imagers like in your phone to do the same thing. In fact, your phone has tiny, tiny, tiny little filters split up all over the place. Okay? But anyway, uh, there's great artistic license. So in this case, to make this final composite image, they used a variety of filters. And then those monochromatic, black and white, are applied with certain colors. Okay? And then you make adjustments in intensity um, and the original decisions in the colors to make the final representation there. Uh, and by the way, I have to share this. When I was watching the reveal in real time, uh, I, I saw Joe DeBasquale and I got so excited. I've worked with Joe before. He sat across the hall from me when I was at the Center for Astrophysics. But I saw one scene, if people were watching closely, where he was deleting stars from the image. I said, Joe, to say it ain't so. Is it truly the case that you do that level of, of uh, you know, uh, Photoshopping? Uh, and you can see here, you know, um, great to hear from you. Thanks for reaching out. It's been quite emotional. As for the question of me deleting stars, ugh, I'm face palming right now. That was a sort of joke that got recorded on camera, ended up being used in the final footage. I'm actually deleting cosmic rays from a Hubble image in that clip, but I was just demonstrating a tool that I almost never used. Yeah, right. Uh, to a cu curious cameraman. Oh, well, it's an action shot. <laughs> so uh, incidentally, he, he, he uh, did uh, highlight that they, they maintain a blog called Illuminated Universe. So any astrophotographers, anybody interested in photography in, in general may find that interest. And by the way, here I put side by side, just yesterday, NASA released the raw data and calibrated that are associated with the first, the, the, you know, the glossy images that were released uh, on the 12th. So I actually pulled up one of the, the, the original images and, and now put it side by side with this. So what you would do is that there would be a filter like this and multiple others, you would apply color to it, and then you do some you know, uh, image magic to make it this. And by the way, for I, I saw some uh, Wabash Valley Astronomical Society people here. They actually use PixInsight sometimes to combine the images. All right, finally, I know I'm going a little over time, but uh, I'm entitled to it because uh, I have to talk about this. So why am I so invested in it? Well, uh, I have a progr program in cycle one. This is gonna be one of the first observations following these first light images that uh, Hebel, uh, Hubble, sorry, that Webb will be in investigating. Uh, this is the remains of a star that exploded approximately 340 years ago. It's a supernova remnant named Cassiopeia A. It's in the constellation of Cassiopeia. The A comes from the fact it's a very bright radio source, the brightest A. So uh, Webb will be able to look at this remnant in a way that we never were able to before and help answer questions about the type of star that was there beforehand and all the chemical abundances, all the stuff that it made in the explosion. 
Um, we're also getting a new Hubble image. What I'm showing here is a time lapse of over 50 years of watching the supernova remnant uh, evolve. Okay? It was an explosion, which means it all started at one point around the star. Okay? And hundreds of years later, it continues to expand. Okay? This is why we need a later image compared to, I mean, this image was taken in 2004. We need a new image to, to be able to directly compare to the web image that's going to be obtained. And there's a whole lot of stuff I could talk, but I'm not going to go into that now, perhaps in the question and answer. But I, I show this from the original proposal that we submitted that was awarded time. This is the best that, that Hubble can do in the near infrared. This is the best that Spitzer can do in the uh, mid infrared. The hope is that the anticipation is that uh, we will see this kind of mission. Notice how it seeps more into the, the remnant. It will be this very uh, intricate, gaseous, clumpy uh, object uh, in the mid infrared with this kind of resolution. Oh, and then finally, I, yeah, I did share as the, the images were, 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 were coming out, I got verification that the um, uh, program was loaded into the schedule of web and uh, the observations are set to be uh, to, to start as soon as uh, about two weeks from now, which I'm terribly excited about. Okay, I know I've hogged a lot of time. There's so much more to go into. Uh, next, we're going to hear from Kate Gassaway and uh, Buggy and Danielle, if you'd like to give a little bit of an introduction. Thank you. Um, our uh, next panel speaker for this evening is the wonderful Kate Gassaway. Kate is a PhD candidate in the School of Aeronautics Astronautics at Purdue University. During an internship at Northrop Grumman in 2016, Kate had the amazing opportunity to work on the James Webb Space Telescope, helping perform structural tests on the sunshield beams. She is the coolest rocket scientist, dog mom, astronomy fashion icon. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Okay, it's working, great. Well, while we wait a second, yes, I'm the College of Engineering representative for today. Um, I did get to work on James Webb Space Telescope in right after my senior year before I started grad school. Uh, it was a great experience and is the reason why I decided I wanted my career to be in uh, designing and building uh, the hardware for space science missions, so really cool experience. Um, I'm here to give you a uh, view into the process of getting James Webb to its final destination. So from launch to L2. Now, if you were with us when we had our launch party uh, bright and early on December 25th, uh, we got all the excitement in of getting to watch it successfully launch. So it was on an ESA Ariane 5. Um, yes, go ahead. Oh, sure. Sure. No, I got it. Good practice for, you know, dissertation. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks for laughing. Uh, <laughs> so at, uh, it launched at 7.20 a.m., bright and early. I uh, got my whole family up, in, up real early to watch me in the basement on Zoom with these lovely people. Uh, and it launched from the Centro Spatial Guiana uh, down in South America. Uh, it was a partnership. This whole mission is a partnership with international partners and ESA provided the launch. So it was contracted back in 2002 before we had any of the launch vehicles that we use now that are names that everybody's heard of. Um, most people were saying, why an Ariane 5? Because back in 2002 when they contracted this, that was what was available and you don't change things like launch vehicle after you've contracted it. So I would be, which is the right button? I just don't know which button, which button? That button, okay, that button. One that it looks like it's been rubbed off. Great, I would be a terrible uh, aerospace engineer if I did not give you some nice pretty pictures of launch vehicles and of engineers and scientists cheering in a mission control room. Um, it's really fun to get to watch a launch and it's especially fun when it's successful. All right, so for that launch recap, it was fully successful. Uh, it was so successful that it was able to extend the mission expectations and lifetime for the James Webb Space Telescope 
the telescope was bottom line needed to perform for five years. It's 10 plus, probably around 20 years of fuel is left on board because the insertion burns of the rocket were so successful and they were able to make uh, minimal corrections to the orbit trajectory after launch. So 27 minutes after launch, it separated and James Webb was on its own heading out toward L2. So what is L2? L2 is a point that's 1 million miles uh, out from the Earth with the Earth in between it and uh, the Sun. So there are these gravitational points in the orbit of any two bodies um, in space. And so if you count the Earth, the Moon, and the Sun as a three-body problem, you have multiple points called Lagrange points. Lagrange is the genius who mathematically calculated that they exist. Uh, and three of them are semi-stable, uh, semi-equilibriums. Um, you can think of it like an equilibrium if you have a pendulum swinging and eventually it'll, it's not huge, uh, like they have at most science museums. Um, if you have a pendulum, it'll eventually come back to sit uh, in a vertical position. That is a fully stable equilibrium between you and the string and the pendulum. Uh, Semi-stable, you need to have some, some amount of energy being put in to keep it there. So Webb is going to orbit around the L2 point. It's not fully stable. You can't just put it there and expect it to stay there. Uh, not the first mission to go out to L2 either. Uh, this is something that's been done in the past. But the main reason that it is out there at that L2 point is so that uh, it can point away at all times from the Earth and the sun. So that's, again, as we just learned, infrared, really important. Big sources of infrared the sun and the earth, very warm things that are very close to uh, James Webb. So we wanna make sure that we keep that out of anything that the instruments are seeing. Okay, so in the first two weeks of flight, most of the components were unfolded and uh, that was 30 major deployment sequences. There were uh, about 140 motors actuating all of this on board. Um, so it had to be all folded up to fit in a rocket. You can't just have it launched as is. It has to be folded up. That's partially to keep it safe, but also just so it fits. Um, so you had the sun shield deployment. That was my small, small contribution. Got to uh, unfold almost first. It was like the second or third thing that had to unfold. And then you had the actual sun shield itself being pulled apart and being separated. So you have five layers, uh, the secondary mirror, primary mirror, and then it was fully unfolded. Um, this is the point at which uh, it could start doing all of the alignment and being brought online so that it can make all the pretty pictures. This was also a process that was fully observed by uh, engineers who were able to uh, communicate with the satellite and get all the information back from it uh, that this was all going properly. So there's two sides. There's the observing side where all of the instruments are, and then there is the sun-facing side. This is mostly because of thermal um, problems. Again, you want to keep everything cold because if it's going to be detecting light that's really far away, you need to do a lot of that with thermal uh, imaging, which means your instruments need to be very cold. How cold? Seven degrees uh, Kelvin, which is almost the absolute zero temperature you can have. Um, very, very cold. The I believe it's about 340 uh, degrees Fahrenheit is what the uh, base layer of the sun shield uh, probably is at. And that's all been engineered to make it so that those uh, instruments can be only needing to cryo cool for about 40 degrees Kelvin. So, yep, instrument cooling. Uh, this is a plot showing the uh, cooling of the satellite itself over time um, for a number of days since launch. And so you can see as the cryo cooling systems start working, uh, those temperatures starting to go down. My last point is talking about micrometer impacts. You may have heard if you've been following along that there was a micrometer strike that was slightly larger than expected. Um, there have been five total recorded strikes that the scientists have seen and engineers have seen. Um, they try to turn the satellite, because they'll know if there's gonna be a meteor sh shower coming. They try to turn that away a little bit so that it uh, doesn't actually hit the mirrors or the uh, instruments, um, but that's not always completely avoidable. You might have something that hits you. Um, 
micrometeorites are objects that are the size of like a fleck of paint. Um, here you can see damage done to a uh, space shuttle. This was from uh, the STS-118. Um, the item, if I have it written down, is three to five millimeters and one millimeter thick did that amount, that amount of damage. This is all stuff that's going really fast. And so anything getting hit will make a big impact. Um, that is not the size that they uh, think that what hit uh, James Webb did, that not that amount of damage, but like that's the kind of damage we're talking about. Um, it is designed to with, uh, withstand impacts like that, but that's, if you hear about, oh, it got hit by a micrometeorite, it's probably okay. Um, like I said, they've had five so far and they're probably gonna get a lot more. All right, that's all I have. Uh, next, uh, please welcome Dr. Ori Fox, who is joining us remotely on Zoom from the Space Telescope Science Institute. Ori is a specialist in mid-infrared detector technology and web software development, working with the MIDI team for the JWST. Ori is also a principal investigator of Cycle 1 JWST program to study exploding stars. He's an active Twitter user and a dancer, providing the latest and live updates from web. Welcome, Ari. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen here. And if you can see behind me, uh, we're very fortunate today. Uh, I am calling you from the Mission Operation Control Room here at the Space Telescope Science Institute. So you can see where all the action happened. You can maybe see my camera, I think, uh, behind me. So there it is, all the computer screens. Um, but it's nice and dark right now, pretty empty. Uh, things have died down here. We are officially done with commissioning. And uh, as you saw, all these beautiful images uh, were released. And uh, the title of my presentation here, it's just a few slides, uh, is The Golden Age of Astronomy is Here. I thought that was um, a good title because of the gold mirrors on JWST. Uh, but really, we are living in uh, a, a unique time period in history. Um, you, you, you think we know everything about the universe, right? But just in the past couple decades, we've made incredible discoveries. We've confirmed the Big Bang. We've discovered dark energy. We've discovered our first exoplanet and then our 10,000th exoplanet. I can't even keep track of the numbers. Um, we discovered gravitational waves and observed them with LIGO, colliding neutron stars and black holes. And this is just in the past couple decades. When you build new great instruments, great things happen. You open up new discovery space and you find fascinating things. And I think the discoveries that will come over just the next year and definitely over the next decade will revolutionize the way that we all look at the universe. So I was told to focus a little bit on commissioning here at Space Telescope Science Institute. I don't know why I made this face when I took the picture of me at my control console. You can see everything going on uh, in the background there. Um, you know, it was four o'clock in the morning. The shifts ran 24 seven. We had three shifts a day, eight hours each, rotating people in from December 25th on the launch day, all the way through to just a couple weeks ago. Uh, and the way commissioning worked is we had these commissioning activity requests that were designed over the past five years and linked together in a very specific timeline. And what we would do is we would go through and complete each commissioning activity before we moved on to the next one where we tested every single detail about the telescope uh, to make sure that that part was working before you could move on to the next part. My specific role was to work on the uh, data analysis. Hey, Ori. 
Yes. Uh, sorry, we've been having some technical difficulties the entire time you've been giving your presentation. Oh. Um, and we just cleared them up. I am so sorry. You missed the best part. Nathan will tell you. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> all right, should, should I start? That's That was good. That was my rehearsal. Should I start all the way back into the beginning? Uh-oh. <laughs> Well, Nathan and Pat got to see it. So should I start back at the beginning? I can't yes, hear you. Yes, please. Okay. All right. Let's see. So. All right. All right. And everybody out there, thank you for your patience. We know we, <laughs> we've been, everybody can relate uh, who's been working with the data. We've been around the clock exploring and responding and, you know, <laughs> So putting this together is nothing short of a miracle. Uh, thanks for your patience. We may be going a little bit longer than we anticipated. In Zoom world, uh, you know, you, you're welcome to come and go as you need. Get some tea or some popcorn, wherever you may be. Uh, Ori, I'm going to shut up now. Please start again. Thanks so much. All right. I'll see if I can deliver those jokes again as well. But um, OK, so my name is Ori Fox. I am an instrument scientist here at the Space Telescope Science Institute working on the mid-infrared instrument team. And I have a special treat for you because I am calling in from the Mission Operations Control Center here at the Institute. You can see it behind me. These are all of the control systems um, where there was a hubbub of activity over the past six months. And you can see right now it's all dark. Uh, we wrapped up commissioning just a couple weeks ago, so it's nice and quiet uh, here today. Um, and I am just going to give a couple slides. I, I started off by saying this is really the golden age of astronomy. It's a nice play on words because, of course, the web mirrors are coated in gold. But really, I was saying we are at the cusp of a rev another revolution in science. And I said, you know, it, it's, it's easy to think that we know everything about the universe, right? Uh, but if you just think about it, over the past couple decades, we've been making discoveries that have just changed the way that we understand our entire world. We've confirmed the Big Bang. We have discovered dark energy. We've discovered the first exoplanet, the hundredth exoplanet, the thousandths. Now it's commonplace. We've identified gravitational waves with LIGO. And so, you know, that was just in the past couple of decades. When you build these new technologies and new machines, you just find out a lot of new things about the world around you. And I guarantee you in the, in the next year and definitely the next decade, we are going to change the way that we view the universe. So I was asked to speak about my specific role here in commissioning. Uh, and so here's a picture of me. I don't know why I was making that face. It was about four o'clock in the morning, sitting at my control panel. We, sh we had 24-7 uh, shifts for six months from December 25th, 2021, launch day, all the way through just a couple weeks ago. And the way commissioning worked is uh, you would have three shifts a day, eight, eight hours each. And people would come in and they would be working through slowly but surely a full timeline of activities called commissioning activity requests, where you went through a checklist and you just made sure that every single component of that observatory worked and worked correctly uh, before you were able to move on to the next one. My specific role was the project scientist for the data analysis tools uh, that were used to analyze the data to make sure that they looked and uh, um, looked and were scientifically accurate. And this is a tool called JDAVIS, the JWST Data Analysis Visualization Tool. The, the main point of this tool is to use a visualization interface, which you can see on the right-hand side here, that integrates sim seamlessly into what we call a Jupyter software environment. This is a Jupyter notebook that allows you to code in Python and interact with that visualization window. And so this is now available to download by the community to use for their normal analysis of the data once it comes off the telescope and gets processed through the pipeline. So I wanted to show just a couple images that were released today 
this is just really exciting because uh, as Dan said, we had the beautiful early release observations yesterday, which were these really fine artistic images that were fully processed. All the cosmic rays and junk were removed, right? Everything was smoothed over. But today, the rest of the raw data from commissioning were released. When the astronomers just had a field day going into the archives and downloading it, and starting to analyze it and to really understand what we were working with. You have to realize that even though we've been preparing for decades, you really don't know what you have in your hands until you see it with your real eyes. And what I wanted to show you today was one of the first images that I opened. It's a famous nearby galaxy called NGC 7469, okay? And there's many beautiful images of this galaxy if you go to Google and, and, and search for it. And I just pulled up one particular image. And this is a subarray. So it's a small cutout of the larger field uh, that is available by JWST. And I want to play a movie for you. And I'm just going to play the movie because when I started off, um, I wanted to compare it to Hubble. And so as shown here on the left is, is the uh, infrared image. And on the right is the Hubble image that was taken a while ago. And um, I, I noticed that when I did the alignment, um, I couldn't actually see anything in the Hubble image. And I, and I wasn't sure why. So these two images are currently aligned, but the Hubble image is blank. And I couldn't understand why. So I zoomed out a little bit and I tried to understand what was going on. So I'm going to play the video and then I'm going to explain to you what, what actually happened, okay? All right, so what happened here is that I thought on the left, I was looking at the entire galaxy of 7469. I don't know 7469 by heart. So I thought that was the entire galaxy. It turns out it's the nucleus of the galaxy. It's like a mini galaxy within a galaxy. This is a nucleus. This is such a small region that Hubble was actually, you know, we always make these comparisons between Webb and Hubble. And we see that Webb, that Hubble could barely resolve this nuclear region. The galaxy itself, I'll play this again, is massive, okay? These two images are scaled to size. They are the exact same image. And to see the nucleus of Hubble, you have to change your whole scaling of, of, of the image and zoom all the way in and see those individual pixels. And you can just see the difference between Webb and Hubble right off the bat. Now, this is going to be exciting because, you know, going into the future, uh, Dan, Danny looks at supernovae. I look at supernovae, Nathan and, and uh, Pat on the call. Now we are going to be able to get into the nuclear regions of these galaxies to look for supernova explosions, whereas before we really couldn't do it. So right off the bat, I mean, this is it, it's just exhilarating. I mean, we, we hadn't done these comparisons even when we had our, our simulations in advance. The last thing I want to show you is another image, just black and white. You know, the astronomy, we love the beautiful pictures. I mean, this is what inspires us to do the work. But there's also something very exciting about just seeing the raw data and getting in there and looking at it in black and white. So there's something very beautiful about that. And another thing we did was a, a look at a far arm in, in this galaxy, NGC 7469. And Nathan will appreciate this because a lot of times the community says when we're looking at, at supernovae at, on stellar arms and we're trying to understand about the surrounding stars, we, we often look at the Hubble images and we say, okay, well, look at this, not, you know, this, this increase in flux here. Let's assume that that's you know, maybe a single star or maybe a couple stars. Uh, they're the brightest, bluest stars in, in the group. Um, but then you get your JWST data and you see that, well, you actually have 100 stars contributing to that one little clump. And so, you know, it just blows you away. Uh, pre, you know, pre, this was previously our standard, the highest, you know, uh, um, resolution image that we had. And, and just 
I, I want to point out this is like a five second exposure with the Webb telescope. And so it's it's just opening uh, a brand new world for us. And so uh, commissioning is over, the data are, are spilling in and, and every image is providing a new wonder and a new discovery for us. So I'll leave you there. Uh, everybody, a round of applause. Thank you. Ori, honestly, I wish I could nerd out with you for the remainder of the session on just what you're showing right now. And hey, doesn't that make your job better or worse? I don't know, <laughs> having this added resolution, right? Okay, very good. Thank you. So if you could stop sharing, I guess we are ready to move to the next person of our segment, which is Elizabeth. Uh, Danielle and Buggy, a little bit of background, please. Um, our next panelist, who is also joining us remotely, is Dr. Elizabeth Newton from Dartmouth College. Um, Dr. Newton is an observational astronomer who specializes in stellar astrophysics and exoplanet science. She will be speaking about the first exoplanet spectrum obtained from Webb. Welcome, Dr. Newton. Awesome. Good, uh, good to be here. Just to check, we can all hear me, right? Yes. We can yes. Hear awesome. Uh, but okay. we don't see your display yet? No, nope, you definitely don't. Okay. Okay, so you, you should... See the display. That's good. Awesome. Um, so it's uh, really great to be here to share some uh, some thoughts on NASA's maybe uh, visually least spectacular first uh, first light image, uh, which is the exoplanet transmission spectrum. So an exoplanet is a planet that orbits a star other than the sun. And as our last speaker just mentioned, uh, we've gone from knowing above about just one exoplanet uh, about 25 years ago to now knowing of just over 5,000. So one way that we can detect an exoplanet is through the transit method. And this is the technique that uh, JWST is gonna be using. So on this slide, I'm showing a picture, not of an exoplanet transit, um, but of Venus transiting the sun um, in, uh, uh, I guess almost 10 years ago now. Um, this is, I actually took this picture with my digital camera. Um, put a filter in front of it. And what you can see here, um, especially if you actually can see uh, my mouse on the screen, is this little black dot in the upper corner. Uh, and this is the shadow of Venus as Venus crossed in between uh, our view, across in front of the sun from our view. Uh, and so Venus is blocking out that little bit of light. Um, and so this is a transit, not of an exoplanet, um, but the idea behind an exoplanet transit is the same. The really big difference is that we actually, we can't resolve the surfaces of other stars, so we can't actually see the little dot that corresponds to an exoplanet. Instead, uh, so since we can't directly see that planet, um, what we can do instead is view the change in brightness as the planet blocks out some of the light from the star. So we monitor the brightness of the star, we wait for the planet to transit, and then we view the decrease in light. And so this image um, is uh, actually the first exoplanet uh, data image from JWST. Um, and it's showing the exoplanet transit, uh, the, the transit of the exoplanet WASP-96b. So first for some context, WASP-96b is nothing at all like the Earth. Um, it's what uh, uh, exoplanet astronomers call a hot Jupiter exoplanet. This is a Jupiter-sized exoplanet but it orbits its host star once every just a few days. Um, Jupiter takes many years to orbit our sun. This one's, this, so this planet is extremely close to its host star. And as such, it's very hot, which gives us the name hot Jupiter. So this plot shows the brightness of the star as a function of time. And here's uh, just a schematic of what's happening, uh, with, of what's happening with this exoplanet transit. This data, all of these yellow points, are what we actually observe uh, when we're monitoring the brightness of the star. We see this characteristic inverted top hat shape that corresponds to the planet crossing in front of the star. In this case, this dip is actually uh, just over 1% uh, decrease in brightness. And you can see that 
uh, all of these data points uh, measure this dip in brightness with exquisite precision. Uh, so this method is, is very close to my heart. Uh, in my research at Dartmouth College, we used, uh, the we used the transit method to find new exoplanets and then to learn about their properties. Our specific interest is not in planets uh, similar to WASP-96b, but, uh, but in planets that are still quite young as we try to piece together how planets form and evolve. So unlike JWST's other first light images, our exoplanet data is a spectrum. Uh, and uh, Daniel Such uh, explained very nicely what a spectrum is, but just to reiterate for anyone just joining us, uh, spectroscopy is a tool where we can split up the light from some source into its respective colors or wavelengths. Um, so for example, here, we could split up the light from this source, which we would do using a spectrograph. Uh, and then we would be able to observe the brightness as a function of wavelength or color of light. We can do spectroscopy with galaxies or stars, and we can also do them with exoplanet transits. When we combine spectroscopy with an exoplanet transit, we observe the transit at many different wavelengths of light, and we make different transit light curves at each of those different wavelengths. Uh, our, the result is what we call a transmission spectrum. So at Dartmouth, um, my group uses transmission spectra to study atmospheric escape from exoplanets, trying to understand how planets lose their atmospheres. With transmission spectra like the ones from uh, JWST, what we'll mostly be looking at is the composition of exoplanetary atmospheres. So this is that first, that first light image, this transmission spectrum of the hot Jupiter exoplanet WASP-96b. So this plot shows the total amount of light that's blocked by the planet. So this is basically telling us how deep the transit is. And we're looking at that as a function of the wavelength or the color of light. This spectrum covers the optical uh, into the near infrared. When there are molecules or atoms present in an exoplanet's atmosphere, the transmission spectrum shows bumps and wiggles at specific wavelengths. So here we're seeing very prominent wiggles uh, due, and these are due to water vapor. Water vapor absorbs at specific wavelengths. Uh, basically, the wherever this, this spectrum peaks, it's been labeled by uh, uh, with uh, water. Uh, so water uh, absorbs light at these specific wavelengths. And at those reason, regions, we see the planet blocking a little bit more light because its atmosphere is filled with water vapor. Uh, and so with spectra like these, by identifying these fingerprints, we can learn about the compositions of these planetary atmospheres. One thing I wanted to mention is that we actually already knew that WASP-96b had water vapor in its atmosphere. Um, and that's because it's an exoplanet astronomers have studied previously with NASA's Hubble Space Telescope. Um, but the data from what JWST is far more precise than what we had before, and it also allows us to look at longer wavelengths of light into the infrared. The reason that we wanted to observe something where we had already studied the planet is so that we could understand really uh, what uh, the intricacies of this data so that we would know when we go to look at other exoplanet spectra that, uh, the, what, that what we're looking at is, uh, is really due to the planet and not due to systematics due to the instrument. Um, and so that's really important because uh, when the exoplanet community first started doing this type of work with Hubble, it took us actually years to figure out how to get the most accurate and precise information out of the data. With JWST, we get to build on that legacy, but you can expect to see exoplanet astronomers learning about this data over the next few years. And while we knew that this planet had water, the JWST data did reveal a surprise already. We thought uh, WASP-96b's atmosphere was clear and free of clouds and hazes. That was actually one of the reasons why it was selected. Uh, as, as a first target uh, for JWST. But these water wiggles aren't actually as large as they would be if the atmosphere was clear. So this tells us that to our surprise, this planet does actually have some clouds and hazes in it. Um, and so 
Uh, there's still a lot to learn about even these well-studied planets like WASP-96b. And with data like these, uh, we'll be able to study the compositions and the chemistries of many different types of exoplanets, including ones uh, that are more similar to Earth in either size or temperature. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to our next speakers. Thank you very much. Round of applause, Elizabeth, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Newton. Uh, now let us welcome another graduate student as our panelist, Colin Hamill from the Department of Earth, Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences at Purdue University. Colin will speak today about what we can understand about planetary atmospheres from the Webb Telescope. Welcome, Colin. Yeah, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit another introduction. Look, in scrambling to bring together, uh, you know, a, a panel of experts, I wanted some representation from our own uh, Earth and atmospheric planetary scientists. Uh, but you know, many of them are in Hawaii at a conference. Some just got married. I mean, it, it's been a lot happening in, in, in the room lately. But thankfully, uh, through uh, some help, Alexandria, I'm blanking on the last name right now. Johnson, who helped put together some slides, some representative work. Uh, Colin's going to, uh, on behalf of the department, as it were, uh, give some insight into why uh, web data is interesting for them. And you just let me know when you want to change slides, okay? All right, thank you. I only have one slide. I'm happy to step in as the uh, last resort for each. Okay. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm actually here to talk about uh, clouds a little more. And uh, like Elizabeth mentioned, how they chose WASP-96b since they thought it didn't have clouds. You get the gist that astronomers, they kind of hate clouds, uh, but I think they're kind of cool and I'm gonna tell you why. In the cloud lab, we seek to understand clouds, how they form and their resultant properties. Essentially, the physics of their formation and how they scatter that light. And we, do, and we use that to better understand planetary atmospheres uh, at home, in our solar system and beyond. I'm looking at this top left image right here. When an atmosphere is clear, that starlight passes right through it. And when that happens, we can see absorption features like those that we see in WASP-96b. Uh, yeah, I'm blanking now. No problems, no that's me. I'm not sharing the screen to Zoom. Uh, let's see, so if I do this, all right, all right, we're back. All right, now everybody can see what you're talking about who are not in the room right now. Okay. Great, I can uh, redo that last sentence or two. I'm looking at that top left atmosphere with that clear atmosphere uh, where when there's no clouds, that starlight can just pass straight through give, uh, and allowing us to see absorption features like we see it in WASP-96b. A clear atmosphere also allows us to probe the infrared emission, allowing us to see what the planet's temperature is like and perhaps its surface properties, if it has one. However, uh, a cloudy atmosphere can significantly mute or block those spectral features entirely. Uh, and the uh, cloudy atmosphere, I just, uh, it's like, sorry, uh, in a cloudy atmosphere, it's kind of like looking up at the sky. When it's dim out, it's gray and muted. And when that happens, uh, it looks very murky down below, but you know the sun is shining right above. And when you see that light from a cloudy atmosphere, that light that's coming from that exoplanet is being reflected, it's being attenuated and polarized all in various ways. And those complex processes are what we look to, are looking into in the cloud lab. If we know how the cloud particles of exoplanets scatter light, and the signatures that we expect to see from those exoplanets. And we can use that information to better understand the atmospheric chemistry, the dynamics, and perhaps the type of clouds that are forming in these exoplanets. To replicate clouds in the lab, we take substances like potassium chloride, which is actually found in cooler uh, temperate atmospheres like mini Neptunes. And we can take those, we can take those particles and we can flow them in by the thousands or we can isolate a single particle and then we can measure how they interact with light at various wavelengths. In this middle image here, that is a single potassium chloride particle levitated in our chamber and illuminated with a green laser. 
To the left of that is a microscopic image of a handful of potassium chloride particles. Those are all way smaller than the width of a human hair and completely invisible to the naked eye. And what we get out of the lab is a measure of how these particles scatter and polarize light depending on where we're looking at it. It's uh, if you think of a puddle of water on the ground and it's a sunny day, it's somewhat like that brightness that you see from that puddle of water will change drastically depending on where you're looking in relation to that puddle. And that's what we're trying to get out of the lab. The cool part of this lab work is that each cloud particle has a unique scattering fingerprint. So in this way, we can understand if the cloud particles coming from a temperate mini Neptune are potassium chloride versus say a zinc sulfide cloud particle. And like WASP-96b, we're not sure of what the clouds are in that atmosphere yet. They could be made up of iron, aluminum oxide, titanium oxide, iron silicates. There's a lot of different cloud particles for these hot Jupiters. And that's what we're looking to get out of this is what are these cloud particles? Combining this information from the lab with uh, atmospheric models and this JWST data will allow us to get a whole new sort of information that will allow us to better understand these cloudy, mysterious planets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colin. Thank you. And uh, she's not here to talk about herself, but uh, just a shout out to Stephanie Olson, who wasn't able to join us today, but has one of the best uh, lab names, the Fab Lab. So Purdue Habitability and Biosignatures Lab. I'll just flash that up and anybody interested can look to the, the, the web page. All right, next on the list, Nathan Smith, ladies. Uh, we have with us today, joining remotely, an incredible mentor to me, Dr. Nathan Smith, who is a professor at the Department of Astronomy at my alma mater, the University of Arizona. Nathan is a professional astronomer who is interested in understanding the fates of and evolutions of massive stars and their influence on the surrounding interstellar medium. Welcome, Nathan. All right, thank you, Danielle. Let me see if I can share my screen here. All right, there, can you see my screen okay? There. Not yet. But let's oh, see. Wait. Let me try again, hold on. Looking okay. good. All right, good. Now let me uh, wait. Now I see a blue screen. That's good. Have multi that's good. No, I, I have to start the slideshow. Okay. Yeah. There. Now you should. Well, you should see a black. Screen. You have the cleanest desktop I've ever seen, Nathan. No, 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 no. It's a, that's a second <laughs> monitor. My uh, my my regular desktop is a horrible mess. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, so I am at the University of Arizona, and I wanted to mention that specifically because this image that I'm talking about um, is made with the NIRCAM instrument on JW, uh, JWST. And the NIRCAM team that built the camera is, is led by uh, people here at the University of Arizona, although I am not on the team, uh, but they're in the same building here. All right, so uh, this is an image, a spectacular image uh, in the near infrared taken with the near cam camera of star formation uh, in a relatively nearby region. So we heard before about how James Webb is supposed to look to the farthest galaxies at high redshift. This is actually fairly nearby. It's in our own Milky Way galaxy, just in a, a neighboring spiral arm. So by comparison to some of the things, it's really, you know, it's just in our backyard, basically. It's about 8,000 light years away, which sounds like a lot, but that's not a lot compared to billions of light years. Um, okay, so this region that is imaged here is a star forming region called NGC 3324. Uh, NGC stands for New General Catalog, and it was new in the end of the uh, 19th century, but the, names, the name sticks. Um, so what I want to do is first give you a little bit of an orientation of where this is. Uh, compared to other things around it in the sky, and then a little bit of background and context for what it is we're looking at, and then we'll take a closer look at uh, the image. Um, so this is, on the left, I have a, a zoom out of the Carina Nebula. Um, so really, uh, so the first thing I, I guess I should note is that the image that 
was released as an image of the Carina Nebula is really not the Carina Nebula. The Carina Nebula is the thing on the sort of on the left. It's the let's see. Can you see my uh, pointer? I don't know if you can see my mouse, but it's so we we can follow that. Yeah, so it's the one on it's this region in here. Um, the the part that was imaged is actually over to the right, uh, NGC three three two four. That's a a different star from your region. That's actually a, about a thousand light years away from the Carina Nebula at a different distance. It has a different age, um, so it's really not the Carina Nebula. It's sort of like confusing, you know, saying someone is from San Diego, or LA when they're really from San Diego, or or maybe worse, saying that they're from Phoenix when they're really from Tucson. Um, so it's a separate region, but it's near the Carina Nebula, and it's often studied uh, in images with it because you can fit it in the same image as you see here. So this is a huge image. This is uh, much bigger than the full moon. I have a one degree bar on the bottom. So the full moon is actually a little bit bigger than this, this square showing NGC 3324. So if we zoom into that, um, that's what's shown on the right here. That's the same region. Um, and what you're seeing is these are optical images that are showing the glowing uh, ionized hot plasma um, that emits in, in lines of certain atoms um, taken in visual wavelengths. Um, and the little box here on the upper right, this box is where the JWST image is. It's, it's taking an image of the boundary uh, of this region. And so that's the reason we're talking about. So now you know a little bit about where it is. Um, and I wanted to show a cartoon here to give you some idea of, of what this is representing in terms of the, the astrophysics that's going on. So this is a region of star formation. Um, stars are, are born, they live and they die. Um, and they're born out of interstellar clouds that are swarming around, you know, orbiting around the Milky Way galaxy and other galaxies. And what happens is that these clouds are very clumpy and irregular in their structure. And some regions are more dense than others. And so sometimes uh, the denser regions can have a strong enough pull of gravity that they pull themselves together and they actually give birth to a new star. Or in some, in many cases where you have a, a very large cloud, you form many stars all together and it forms a cluster. Um, now, when you form lots of stars like the sun, the sun is a relatively low mass star um, and that doesn't do a whole lot to its surroundings. But when these clumps of gas get pulled together and form a massive star, something that's say 15 or 20 or 100 times more massive than the sun, then something quite different happens. And what happens is those massive stars actually are very luminous. They can be tens of thousands or a million times more luminous than the sun, meaning they're the radiation output. And they're also hotter, which means that their radiation comes out mostly in the ultraviolet. And that's important because ultraviolet radiation uh, tends to zap the surrounding gas. It's, it's kind of like you get a sunburn from UV radiation from the sun. Here you get the ultraviolet radiation actually breaks the atoms apart and strips the electrons off of the, the atoms and turns it into a hot plasma. And so what ends up happening is that when massive stars form, that's sort of shown by these blue stars that are in the middle of this region. Over time, they start to carve out a cavity of hot, low density gas. And that forms a basically a bubble that then it pushes out and expands and it sweeps up the gas around it. And so once massive stars are born, they actually begin to destroy the cloud out of which they form. Um, however, what's pretty interesting about this is that in the process of destroying the cloud, they also sweep it up and compress that gas into new dense clumps, which can form new generations of stars uh, around the border. And as this process continues, you can actually form multiple generations of stars that then at the end have this big, you know, they all have this big swarm of, of stars that have multiple ages. Um, and so that's what we're seeing in this image. This, if you remember the, the image I just showed before here, uh, this James Webb image is, is right at the border. So it's tracing uh, the interface, right, at, uh, between the hot, bubble on the inside that's powered by ultraviolet radiation and also winds from these hot massive stars and the cold dense gas that's uh, here shown in this red shell on the outside. Um, and so that's what we can see. And there's evidence here in this image of stars being born. One of the things that happens when stars are born is that material is being accreted onto the star in a big disc. It ends up squirting out in uh, protostellar jets, these, these bipolar jets there. They come out in two directions at the North Pole and the South Pole. And on the left here is sort of a zoom in. 
this star uh, is sending out material in some of it is squirting out into the cavity, but some of it is blowing into the cloud itself. And so this gives us this infrared image gives us a nice view of that. So it's really showing so this infrared image is showing us what's going on at that interface where the gas is being compressed by the mass of stars and, and uh, forming new generations of stars. Um, what I wanted to do next is uh, look at the details of this image and compare it to the optical. We have an HST image of the same region. And also, if I have time, there's a, a, there's a MIRI image, which is a different camera on James Webb showing longer wavelengths. So if you look at this, you can see a lot of intricate structure. And there's lots of stars that you can see mixed in uh, with the clouds. When I compare it uh, to the optical, the optical uh, image from HST looks quite different. Now it doesn't cover the, the entire region. There's only a portion uh, that is shown. But if I blink between these, I've tried to align them as best I could with PowerPoint. You can see, like if you pick out some stars, you know, you can see that they're, they're not moving very much. Um, and so you can see some stars appear, like a lot of the regions in the optical are just dark. You just see an opaque dark cloud and when you look in the near infrared with JWST, um, a bunch of stars are appearing. And that's because we're seeing through those dark, cold clouds and seeing what's going on inside or in some cases behind them. Uh, you also see some stars that are much brighter in the infrared than in the optical. Like if you look up, uh, you look up here at this star, right? It's, that's actually probably a star in the background. That's probably a red supergiant uh, like Betelgeuse that's in the background. Um, so lot, stars can have different brightness in the optical and infrared, um, but some of them are actually stars embedded inside this region. Like there's this thing here, if you can see my pointer, it's totally invisible in the optical. Uh, and, and again, this region that I showed a blow up of over here, you can, whoops, I'm going the wrong way. I'm getting ahead of myself there. You can see um, some of that outflow activity from a cluster that's being born inside those clouds. Um, another thing that's sort of interesting is if you look at, you pick, again, pick some stars for reference and they're not moving, but it kind of looks like the clouds are moving. Like if you look, you look at, at this interface here, look at the boundary and you look at some of the boundaries over here, when I blink between them, oops, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, when you blink between them, it looks like the clouds are moving as if they're expanding or something, but they're really not. What's happening is that with Hubble in the optical, you're seeing the hot, uh, ionized plasma that's on the inside of the nebula. And when you're looking in JWST in the infrared, you're seeing the stuff that was dark in this image get lit up. So it looks like it's moving outward, but really you're just seeing different gas at different uh, temperatures. So that's kind of a fun uh, comparison. I could blink these things for hours. You see some of the same structures, like goofy things like this. This is actually a shock uh, from a stellar jet that's plowing through the surrounding material. It's a bow shock. And it, you can see it in the James Webb image, but you can actually see it better in Hubble. And that's just because of certain uh, lines from certain elements being brighter in optical wavelengths. Um, all right, so one last thing is this mid-infrared image. So this is the MIRI instrument uh, mixed in with uh, the, the sort of grayish purple kind of image here is, includes some longer infrared wavelengths. This includes or what we call mid-infrared or sometimes thermal infrared. It's more like the, the kind of the vision that the predator has where you can see warm things glowing. And this allows us, since it's even longer wavelengths, it allows us to see even deeper uh, into the cloud. And, and one of the neat things here is you can see over on the right, there's a whole cluster of, uh, a whole cluster of young stars that are forming and stuff around them. You can also see, uh, like if you look at this object right here, you can see it, you're seeing deeper in uh, when I believe it, you're actually identifying the star that's driving an outflow there. So there's a lot of fun stuff uh, in these images and, and we'll be able to do this with lots, you know, we'll get similar images of lots of other star from regions in the Milky Way and also some things in nearby galaxies um, in great detail to help us understand uh, this process of star formation and, and how massive stars are destroying uh, their natal clouds out of which they formed. All right, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan, everybody. Wonderful. Please, yeah, yeah oh. I'll just start with the next speaker. So please join us in welcoming Dr. Uh, Rodolfo Montes Jr., who is an astrophysicist, uh, 
astrophysicist at the Harvard and Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Dr. Montes uses multi-wavelength observations to identi identify the physical processes that lead to asymmetric nebula structures. He's joining us virtually today. Welcome, Dr. Montes. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me okay? You, you can hear me? You can see yes, my slides? Can. Excellent, can. great. Uh, I'm gonna talk today about the Southern Ring Nebula, which is a dying star, much like our sun, and tell you a little bit about what we see in this image and what are the cool things that we uh, can learn about this object. Uh, so this is the Hubble's image of this nebula. We saw it earlier uh, in during Dan's introduction talk. And this is a planetary nebula and typically how we look at them is in the optical because they are very bright in the optical. And so you see this gaseous shell of material and you see there's two stars in the center. Uh, the star that's actually lost all of this material into space that we're, that we're now seeing in orange and blue and red is actually that really faint star next to this bright star. And that this is actually a binary system in the center of this star, uh, in the center of this nebula that's formed this uh, gaseous shell. So what's happening here is that a star like our sun is, spends most of its time pretty happy burning hydrogen into helium. And that process essentially deposits a bunch of helium in the core. And that is harder to burn. You have to be more dense and more hot. And so that doesn't burn as readily. But over time, you build up pressure around it from all the mass on top. And that will increase the temperature of the core to the point that the helium ignites. And then that starts the whole death process of, of the star. And that starts to slow lose all of this material into space. And that material is what we see in this image right now. Uh, that burning of helium produces a lot of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And that's actually a lot of the atoms that we see in the nebula are from that process. So you have a lot of hydrogen, a lot of helium, a lot of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. You have neon. All, all these atoms are in this gas and they were once a part of the star and now they're spread all in all around the star. And moving away from the star um, at, at some measurable velocity, velocities. So this is what Hubble showed us of this object, uh, the Southern Ring Nebula. This is the image that we all saw uh, the other day and that we saw earlier today. Uh, this is the near infrared image of this object. And then this again is the uh, mid infrared image of this object. And one of the things that uh, if I just blink through this sequence here, you see there's a lot of similarities in the structures in the overall general structures, but there are a lot more detail in these new images that are just fodder for astronomers like myself. One of the first things that I wanna point out is that this star here is very red. You can kind of make out that faint companion, that faint, uh, central star there, but here it's very red and that's surprising to us because it's a very hot star. Like, like we heard from Nathan, very hot stars produce a lot of ultraviolet emission. That ultraviolet emission is what is exciting the atoms in that gaseous cloud surrounding those stars. And so we don't expect to see it that bright in this mid-infrared view. That tells us that there is probably some circumstellar material around there. The other really cool stuff you'll notice is that there's these great big protrusions. And the thing you have to remember when you're looking at objects like this is that it's a three-dimensional object in space, but we're looking at a 2D projection of that. And so untangling the geometry of this system is a very big part of what we're trying to do with this observation and with other observations that came before it. And one way that we try to do that, I'll show you quickly here, this is a gallery of of images taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of planetary nebulae. And it's showing you that they all have different structures and shapes and very surprising structures and shapes in some of these. And how do you get a, a process of a star dying to generate these types of shapes and structures? I put them here into a, a sequence that doesn't mean too much, but you'll see there are some sim similarities across these. You'll see some elliptical shapes. You'll see some that have these what we call butterfly shapes or bipolar shapes. You have two lobes and then you have a narrow part in the middle. And sometimes you see nested structures like this um, Parker Nebula and also nested structures here and here. 
So astronomers like to categorize things and we categorize these things into various generic morphologies. And now we try to understand how do you get all of this variety of shapes from one process. And so we take the extreme example of this extremely bipolar structure. We, sh we, we say, okay, well, if you had some kind of obstruction in the central region, when that star starts to lose material, it will lose material into the, into the polar regions. And over time that would expand to create these bipolar like structures and shapes. But how do we get this material out here? One way to do it is with the binary. If you have a binary star in the center, then that binary star as it's losing mass will be impacted by the orbital uh, dynamics of that system and it'll gravitationally focus material into the equatorial plane. And then so when you do start to lose material very rapidly, it'll start to be uh, as asymmetrically shaped like the way we see in these nebula. And so that's what we're really excited about for this particular object here is that maybe that we're actually seeing a torus around that central star that that could be why it's red it could have a debris disk of some kind around it and that debris disk could be the remnants of a planetary system it could be the remnants of a companion star it could be anything and that could be shaping and launching outflows and we could be seeing those outflows actively shaping and disrupting uh, the structure of this nebula. And that's Dramatic all pause. The You're done? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, that's right. Round of applause for Rodolfo. Thank you. Believe me, it, it's taking everything for me to hold back and ask questions. I, I know we're, 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 we're going long. I think we have water if anybody needs to be hydrated. <laughs> <laughs> as we push on. Uh, I think Patrick is next. Is that right? Please, an introduction. Our next panelist is Dr. Patrick Kelly, an assistant professor at the School of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Minnesota. His research focuses on supernova explosions and gravitational lensing by galaxies and galaxy clusters. Dr. Kelly will be sharing his insights our insights with us on the James Webb Space Telescope deep field image that was released by the president on Monday. Uh, welcome, Dr. Kelly. Well, thanks a lot, yeah, and thanks, thanks for having me. Um, very well, I, I uh, so I'll talk about this spectacular image here and, and what- um, Oh wait, Patrick, so at the moment we see a uh, black screen, uh, we don't see the image. You don't see the spectacular image, okay. Try this again. Let's see here. Uh oh. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. Let me try now, this. okay. Yeah, we saw the presentation. It might be one of those things where you have to keep it in this mode, but let's try the. the yeah, I the, think I've shared the desktop. So, is that, do you see it now? Now. That's good. Okay. Great. All right. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, so um, I'm uh, really excited to talk about. Uh, this amazing picture and um, and what James Webb should be able to do uh, in uh, its observations of other galaxy cluster fields like this. And so, um, so what, what is this? Well, this is a, a gravitational lens. And so it's one of the biggest gravit or biggest gravitationally bound structures in the universe. Galaxy clusters are the, you know, the biggest um, structures where all the galaxies are, you know, bound to each other. So they can't escape the gravitational uh, mutual attraction keeps them together and they're just you know uh, you know 10 to the 15 solar masses in them so there's huge amount of matter here and most of it is also dark matter so they they're um really excellent places to study study dark matter as well and so but let's just start by looking at um the old the hubble space telescope image of this cluster and you know they it, it was not the you know the deepest existing um, set of observations of a galaxy cluster, but this will just give you an idea. So this is what, you know, uh, we, we had before, and then you can see now what we have now. And so it's just, um, you know, I think absolutely amazing. So, you know, what, what, what can you notice here just by eye? Well, um, immediately, and so you can see, you know, that you have these, these, these arcs, and these are background galaxies that are magnified. Um, and so you can see way more, you know, detail in them. You can see individual star forming regions, um, and, and some of them you can see, uh, and, and the other thing that sort of jumps out at me is the number of, of globular clusters. So these are 
you know, groups of old stars in the, in the foreground galaxy cluster. So the yellowish, whitish galaxies are the galaxies in the galaxy cluster, the you know, elongated arcs are behind it and they're gravitationally lensed and magnified. Um, but you can see, you know, in Hubble image, you can't, you know, you see this diffuse light, but here we can we start to see uh, globular clusters, which is um, just, uh, you know, even by eye, it, it, it's, it's pretty spectacular. Um, so what, so I thought, you know, people, you know, these are very spectacular images. So what's going on here? Well, um, a gravitational lens is, uh, you know, in, in any object that has such amount of mass and the light traveling by it will be deflected by that matter. And if uh, the galaxy cluster is in the right place, kind of a long line of sight to uh, a galaxy, say in the background, you can see here, then um, uh, the galaxy cluster will direct light around it in more than one direction and that light will reach us. And that will create multiple images of the, the background galaxies. And so this is called strong lensing. Uh, and so what happens in strong lensing? Well, you get multiple images of the, the same source and you also get magnified images of those uh, of, of the, the background source. And so the magnification allows you to see more detail and detect fainter objects. And so galaxy clusters become these fantastic natural magnifying glasses. It's like having, you know, it's like, uh, and JWST T times ten, uh, or or something like that. Uh, you you can you can accomplish a lot more if you're interested in background objects. And as I said, galaxy clusters are also made mostly of dark matter, and so if we can we can actually use these positions of these background galaxies to figure out where the dark matter is in the galaxy cluster. And so one the uh, Webb has a fantastic spectrograph. Um, and this is a, one of the spectrographs here that actually gets a spectrum of every object in the field. And, uh, and so here, what, what this um, observation is doing is figuring out the redshift or uh, essentially the distance to uh, two images here. And it's finding that, uh, you can see on the right, these are actually the same galaxy. So we can use uh, web to actually you know, connect the dots, figure out you know, which images are of the same galaxy and therefore where's the dark matter. And, um, and if we know where the dark matter is, then we, we can really figure out how, how magnified the images are and calibrate um, the cluster as a uh, natural magnifying glass. So here's, here's just a, you know, a map, for example, of the, of the total amount of matter in a galaxy cluster, mostly uh, of dark matter. And um, so these are kinds of maps that we should be able to make with much greater uh, precision and, and accuracy uh, with, with James Webb, where we can see many more of these multiply image galaxies, which all constrain the dark matter. So that, uh, so, you know, instead of having maybe 10 sets of images, we might have a hundred. Uh, so so it's, a, it's really exciting. Um, and galaxy clusters, there's a special region where the magnification sort of goes, becomes really, really high and, and reaches thousands. So we can even potentially, you know, see across you know, individual stars, you know, all the way across the universe. And this is something that's uh, been uh, discovered pretty recently. Um, and so I kind of think of galaxy clusters as a sort of like national forests, like the land of many uses. You've got uh, all kinds of different, different uses that people put them to. You can study the dark matter. Uh, how does it relate to the stars? Um, and uh, you can study uh, using its magnifying effect, uh, how galaxies evolved. Um, when the universe was much younger. How you know we don't know exactly why galaxies look the way they are today, and uh, there's a you know competition between gravity pulling gas in, and then the the supernovae that um, uh, that, that we've talked about a lot so far uh, inject a lot of energy and push matter out. So there's this you know competition, and uh, and JBC allows us to see the details using these gravitational lenses. We can study really faint sources, which may have, uh, through their UV radiation, these hot stars that Nathan was talking about, um, have uh, made the universe transparent again, but we don't really understand how. Uh, and, uh, and then what I'm really excited about, and I'll show an image here, is we can you know, see individual stars um, almost across much of the observable universe, which is, I think, pretty crazy. Uh, so here's just, I, you know, I've been, like everybody else, I've been looking at the JWST data the last day and uh, comparing it to Hubble again, here's just, you know, the black and white kind of image. And so you can just see how amazing it is. Um, so here's here's this picture of, of this reionization, how massive stars and galaxies, uh, you know, shoot out their uh, UV photons, which break apart atoms. And, 
and and allow then light to you know, ultraviolet light to travel through the universe. And so we don't understand that, and that's something galaxy clusters be able to find out. And here's uh, you know one example of a star uh, that, that we found that that's um, uh, behind a galaxy cluster, and due to the, the, the cluster's magnification, we're able to see it um, individually. And, uh, and so what's happening? Well, there's a, a, an object in the cluster that's moved in the right place and made it briefly brighter. You can see that on the right and the bottom there. And so uh, that tells us that it's a very small object, in fact, a star. And so this is what I am really excited about, uh, where, so we need, we actually need another JWST image too, but if we can get a couple of those, we should be able to start seeing many of these stars. And uh, HST has allowed us to find the really hot stars, but JWST should allow us to find uh, cooler, uh, lumin very luminous stars. Uh, also, uh, they're called red supergiants. And so um, hopefully we'll start seeing that soon, but we need another round of images of the same, same field. So, um, so, uh, so very exciting. And I think uh, there's going to be a lot to learn here. And I'm, I'm uh, just really blown away by these images. I, they're a lot, lot better. I, you know, I, I didn't really know what to expect, but it's, it's, it's pretty cool. I, I'm pretty amazed. Let's have a round of applause uh, for Dr. Kelly. Uh, one thing I have to mention here is that one of the most asked questions was what was the difference in the exposure times between the JWST images versus Hubble images? So the Hubble images, which we are comparing to this was a 10 day exposure versus this being just 12.5 hours of exposure. So with this itself, we are being sensitive to one of the, to most of the farthest galaxies. So I just have to mention it because it excited me the most, so. Uh, okay, our final speaker for the evening here is Dr. Kyunsi Apologies, Dr. Kyun Soo Lee. Dr. Lee is an associate professor from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Purdue University. She specializes in galaxy cluster formation and evolution in cosmic time and investigates spatial and kinematic structure of distant galaxies. Welcome, Sue. Yes. Can you hear me? Hi hey everyone, um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so today I wanted to uh, tell you a little bit about this last image that uh, James Webb um, released earlier this week, um, uh, uh, known as the Stefan's Quintet. Um, so what you wanna know about this uh, system is that it really should be, should have been called the Stefan's Quartet. And that's because even though you see five galaxies here, one, two, three, four, and five, um, there is a one, one of these galaxies is an innocent bystander, which is much closer to us and have nothing to do with this um, very beautiful cosmic mass that you're looking at here. And you can almost uh, find a guess which one that is and uh, by looking for the galaxy that is that looks the least disturbed. And it's actually this one here. It's a nice, uh, this galaxy, which is uh, not part of the system. The other four though, are interacting. Um, they are actually physically close together and they're interacting gravitationally. Okay, so you may have noticed that um, this image is actually Hubble image, which I did my best to try to align with the James Webb image uh, that they released, which I'll show you uh, in, in a little bit. So um, what is most notable here is these two galaxies here are almost merged together. But together, they're also actively interacting with this galaxy here, right? So, so these kind of gravitational interactions uh, create uh, tidal waves, which you see here, long uh, tail that uh, stretches out from these galaxies. But also, it creates the shock waves, which, um, uh, which basically uh, rip apart galaxies, uh, so star stars and uh, dark matter and uh, gas um, alike. So essentially what you're looking at here is that there is a shock front that is uh, building up between these two galaxies and the other one. So what you see here in the Hubble image, so this is almost like a true color image. So if you were to be close to this uh, system, these blue star, this a string of blue stars would actually look fairly blue, okay? So these are the, so, so this type of shock fronts can actually ram the gas together um, and uh, ends up creating um, 
forming lots and lots of new stars. In this case, uh, it looks like almost millions of stars, uh, new stars are being formed, some of which appear here as a blue stars. Um, so I think that several of the previous speakers actually did a nice job ex explaining um, the difference between the Hubble and the James Webb in the sense that a dust is something that is ubiquitous in our universe. And particularly, they're very good at hiding the interesting, the most interesting uh, phenomena like star formation, which is, would be spectacular, except that we don't actually get to see them very much, uh, particularly in visible wavelength. And that's because dust is good at uh, hiding them. So um, having said that, so here is the James Webb Space Telescope image. So here is the visible, visible wavelength on left. The right is the composite image between the near infrared and the uh, mid infrared combined together of the same system. So again, so these blue, these uh, shock fronts that show up here as a blue uh, string of stars are actually, a, you can see that there's actually a lot more going on here. And that's because a one near infrared um, cuts through dust much better than um, the visible wavelength. Um, so James Webb's, uh, so you can actually see a lot more stars that are being formed here, but also because of the mid infrared, which uh, also trace some of the molecules that get excited by this star formation, um, including the poly, uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbon or PA lines. So they, they actually do emit their own. Uh, so, so these uh, mid infrared emissions actually trace the gas themselves that actually end up forming these new stars. Um, so you can see that, uh, so, so this is precisely the reason why the James Webb Space Telescope is gonna tell us so much more about all this interesting phenomena and all the things that uh, result from the galaxy interactions. Having said that, perhaps the larger question is, uh, why do we even care about galaxy interactions, right? Our own galaxy is not interacting. Uh, Milky Way is pretty isolated. The, the short answer to that question is that we think that galaxy interaction is one of the primary ways that galaxies actually grow. Uh, it's just that Milky Way is not doing that actively right now, but it must have done, done so uh, many times in the past. So um, just to prove my point, I wanted to show you a, a short video that basically shows, uh, it's a time-lapse video of showing the dark matter simulations, dark matter distributions, starting at the beginning of the universe and uh, move forward in time. Um, so here in the next video that I'm about to show you, um, the, the regions that have a higher concentration of dark matter will show up as uh, white-ish um, knots, uh, whereas the darker regions means that there is uh, less matter there than anywhere else. There's no galaxies here, it's only dark matter. Okay. So it's gonna start with a universe that is fairly smooth, but then at, because of the gravity, um, so they're going to start slowly begin to develop into higher density regions and lower density regions. And even though this is all just dark matter, which is the most, um, most of the matter is made up of dark matter. What, what uh, you actually expect to see here is that these uh, bright, brighter knots is where the gravity is gonna pull in the gas um, and start forming stars. So the, the one thing, the one way to think about this is that, um, of course, we don't see the whole thing like this, but what we're gonna see is that these, we're only going to see these brighter knots as uh, sites of galaxies, right? So in a way, oops, is it still moving or not? Oh, it was, sorry. <laughs> okay, we're gonna have to start again, I guess. Does it? Okay, sorry. Okay, so what I'd like you to, uh, what I'd like to ask you is to try to um, focus on one of these knots. Or maybe you went too far. I, I wanted to sort of show, yeah. So this is a time lapse, and I wanted to see, I wanted to show um, how these big knots actually form. Uh, maybe go a little bit. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. 
All right, so if you look at this one in particular, you can see all the smaller clumps are actually going towards this larger clump, making the larger clump grow. And that's precisely the way the galaxies grow. Um, the smaller things, so remember that we first started out with the fairly smooth universe, and then those knots that develop, which are the, 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 the uh, structures that the, the collapses because under its own gravity, um, those are the sites of the galaxies. And these galaxies, you can clearly see by looking at those knots that they grow by merging into other clumps. And which what, what, what that naturally means is that the galaxies that are living in those uh, dark matter structures are also going to merge into one another. In other words, galaxy interaction is ubiquitous. And it's actually the one of the major uh, mechanisms for galaxies to grow and form uh, newer stars. And th these simulations also show that these uh, this kind of a galaxy interactions are actually much more frequent in the distant past compared to um, in the present day universe. So what we actually do expect to find um, is that uh, these interactions will be very, very commonly found. So in fact, uh, here are some examples of the interacting galaxies or galaxies that show some signs of inter inter interactions in different ways um, in a distant universe. So these are galaxies much, much farther away than the Stefan's quintet that I showed you earlier. So again, here you see that these galaxies show clumps. Some of them actually do show similar tidal tails uh, that, as you saw in the other image. Except, of course, um, it's much smaller because these are distant galaxies. And admittedly, um, these images are decidedly not all that spectacular. And that's because, one, they're distant, so they're small. There's also this angular resolution issue that many speakers uh, spoke before. Um, and also, the, the Hubble is a much smaller telescope than the James Webb. Um, so James Webb is going to do so much better at finding and identifying these galaxies so that we can actually study these uh, in much more detail. One final thing um, is also that these images are taken with a near-infrared camera at Hubble, with Hubble. Um, remember that then explained at the very beginning that light stretches out as the universe expands. That means that these galaxies, by the time this light uh, left these galaxies, universe was much, much, more, uh, much smaller. What that means is that what we are looking at here is actually uh, ultraviolet light that um, is actually shorter wavelength than this image here on the left, okay? So James Webb has both uh, capabilities to image in both near infrared as well as, well as mid infrared. In other words, James Webb will have, will be able to image those distant galaxies actively interacting with other sources in both wavelength, the wavelength that uh, rest frame visible as well as the rest frame near infrared. So I am very excited to, um, to see these images. And also um, I am sure that the James Webb is going to be uh, really, really crucial in uh, completing our understanding of how galaxies actually um, primeval galaxies, these the distant galaxies that we see, which are the building blocks of the, uh, the larger galaxies that we see around us. Um, so it's really going to play an instrumental role in completing our understanding of how our galaxy came into being um, and uh, will provide with a much more complete understanding of the whole processes, uh, the, the role of the dust, the role of the new starburst that is uh, uh, giving uh, that is uh, resulted from this uh, galaxy interactions and so much more. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, okay. So now we are at the end of the show almost. We got that good. Um, I want to be respectful of everybody's time. I got word that David LaCrone, who joined us for the original launch party, might be out there somewhere in the audience, not there anymore. So no, uh, I'm here. Oh, he is great. Yes. Okay. 
Hey, do you want to say any just brief words of your reaction? So, by the, by the way, so David Lacrone was a project scientist for many years for the Hubble Space Telescope. So he has some kind of a history with space telescopes and first light uh, reveals. So do you want to offer any uh, very quick words? Yes, uh, I'm just uh, amazed at the clarity of these images compared to Hubble images. And uh, I hadn't expected the, uh, the angular resolution to be all that different. Uh, James Webb is a much bigger diameter telescope, but it's operating at longer wavelengths. So the diffraction patterns are you know, comparable between Hubble and, and James Webb, but uh, I'm just blown away that, that, that physics is correct, but somehow in practice it's worked out so that James Webb is so much better than we than I expected. Uh, certainly it's greater sensitivity is expected, but the clarity of the images is remarkable. Thank you for your input. Okay, uh, with the final moments that we have, uh, I will display my final slide, which is just leaving with some, you know, we have David Lacron speaking. There's been a number of people offering their reactions. Uh, you know, the image is culmination of decades of dedication, talent, and dreams, but they are also just the beginning of what we've been exploring right now. They've moved me as a scientist, as an engineer, and as a human being. And the thought that I like to come back to often, uh, something that Carl Sagan said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. The point I really uh, reverberate with, we are a way for the universe to know itself. Isn't that something? You know, we offer the universe a consciousness and an ability to evaluate itself. I think that's kind of cool. So moving forward, there are many ways that you can learn more and there are many way, uh, much more to come into the future. Uh, I did want to give a shout out to the Wabash Valley Astronomical Society. Did I see somebody here? Yes, in the front. Uh, there's a, there are opportunities for you to join local clubs. Uh, there's also on the national, international scale, uh, the AAVSO, right? Uh, here at Purdue, uh, we're trying to get uh, many uh, uh, public outreach and, uh, activities, including the, the Astro Boilermaker Telescope with, uh, in the Purdue Wildlife Area. Uh, Brian B. Healer if, and, and, and your, your daughter, if you're listening, thanks so much uh, for your help with that. Um, and if you're interested, you can reach out to us at Physics and Astronomy. We can absolutely connect you to the right thing. And, and the website is a great resource. We'll, we'll list out that you can uh, find out more. Um, but with that, I'm going to leave it at a, at a conclusion. And then we're going to open up to questions uh, and answers uh, for anybody else. But again, thank you very much for your time. We hope it was worth your while. Take care. Well, if there are any questions, we'll... Uh, take it at this time and people I yeah people who are still in uh, zoom and if they have questions please let us know we'll just address them anybody from the audience Dan but I have a question um, for you so uh, there were some uh, contro controversies regarding the naming of the web telescope so do you have any comments on that a very fair and important question. So for a, a number of years, there's been some discussion about the actual naming of the facility as the James Webb Space Telescope. So James Webb himself was a NASA administrator uh, in, in the 1960s. And uh, he led the NASA program through kind of a golden era of many uh, flagship missions, including, you know, ultimately leading up to the uh, landing of the Apollo missions on, on, on the moon. But more recently, there's been some revelation, some, some evidence uh, showing that he was complicit with the unfair discrimination of uh, workers at the State Department and even at, at NASA under his uh, watch. And that includes people of the LGBTQ community. So uh, there's NASA conducted an investigation into this. They, their official statement is that at the time they find no evidence uh, warranting a change of the name, but some people feel that the documentation of that report is insufficient and some of the conversation continues uh, to this day. Yeah, so um, this has been a big thing. Um, I have been on Twitter a lot for James Webb because a lot of people have been making really great memes and sharing a lot of great images, but there also has been a lot of conversation. So um, 
at Purdue, like we do strive for inclusion, um, especially for our LGBTQ plus students, faculty, staff, everyone else. Um, so there's lots of resources. There was actually recently a pretty concise New York Times article called, it's written on the back of my hand, who was James Webb anyways, that kind of gives an overview of what Dan just covered. Um, and also um, this time was commonly referred to as the lavender scare. So there is a book and there was also a documentary that came out last year about it if you are interested in learning that part of America's history. Um, we also have a link tree. Um, so it's linktr.ee forward slash Purdue Fizz Astro, or yeah, Fizz Astro, Purdue Fizz Astro. And it's got lots of links on it, like the website for this event, um, our physics, Purdue physics webpage. Um, and also I will put some resources there for this particular conversation. Also, um, as Dan mentioned, I was up until 2.30 this morning uh, putting pretty pictures together. So all of that is compiled in a folder, the link for which will also be on this link tree. Again, that's Purdue Fizz Astro. Any questions about the images? Uh, if there are no, okay, sure. We'll ask one or two and then we'll, 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 we'll cut it off the, the broadcast. Yes, in the back. Uh, so I was under the impression that this particular image of Karina Nebula, so like this is the first time I'm learning that it's actually a very, very small part of the actual entire nebula. I was just curious, was there any particular reason to choose this little side segment? I mean, rather than maybe let's say center of the nebula or something like that. Like, of course, not center, but any other edge. That's great. So uh, Nathan, I see you there and smirking. So leave it to Nathan Smith. By the way, the cosmic joker, he sent me an email leading me to believe that his slides were going to be something completely different. And I was a little bit nervous, but of course he delivers in, in a major way. And one of the first things he says is pointing out why NASA was wrong and, and how they pitched this as Corinna Nebel. Anyway, uh, any ideas why they would have chosen that particular region, Nathan? Um. It's a little bit of a mystery to me because, uh, as far as I know, you know, I don't know anyone who works on the Crina Nebula who was, you know, privy to the discussion about the the choice. I think uh, there was a Hubble Heritage image of this region that I showed, uh, and it's you know kind of a pretty picture. But why they, you know, why they avoided the stuff in the center of the of the actual Crina Nebula, I don't know. I mean, it could be that they were afraid of getting too close to Eta Carina, which is the brightest infrared object in the sky and would have melted the telescope if they accidentally pointed at it, probably. Um, I, I don't know why, you know, they're probably, you know, they probably considered many regions and they picked this one because it's a, it's, it's a nice uh, illustration of complex structure at the border of a star forming region. Um, but there is plenty more uh, in the Carina Nebula itself. You can see all kinds of jets and pillars and all that stuff. Um, so no, I don't know why or who or who made the decision. Right. So there was some selection panel who went through a particular objects. It wasn't like a, a a great vote amongst all astronomers. We want this thing and the other. No, this was a closed room discussion amongst certain people. Uh, any other questions? I, saw, I I thought I saw another hand potentially. Question from um, a Zoom audience. How often are we gonna get images from James Webb Space Telescope? Like, uh, what is the frequency like when it comes to the archive? Probably that it's rolling out pretty right now. Uh, or you you want to speak a little bit about this? The question is, you know, how often can we anticipate images coming out? Yeah, new data come down every single day during the downlink. Um, that's an interesting side note. There's only so much onboard memory, um, just like your computer. And so they need to do a data dump every single day. Um, and in fact, some of the instrument modes take data too quickly um, so that if you took that sort of data all day, you would actually fill up your onboard memory before you could dump it. So they have to be careful about what types of observations they schedule. But from a public perspective, um, I don't um, know the exact frequency, but I can tell you that there are a lot of other very exciting images that are planned and probably in the relatively near future. So um, I think this is really just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I think we'll leave it off on that thought. Again, panelists out there, uh, audience out there, thanks so much for joining us out there in the internet. Uh, people here in person, thank you for joining. 
Uh, we hope we delivered. Again, this was a real scramble to put something together so sh shortly after the first images, but uh, we wanted to have that sense of uh, you know awe and uh, discovery and share with everybody here. Uh, I hope you have a wonderful evening. Uh, take care and stay in touch. Uh, personally, I would like to thank Dan too, who did such an exceptional job uh, stringing into together all the panelists and like pulling this off together. Thank you, Dan. You're wonderful. Thing I would like to say. Oh well, I guess two things. Thank you, Dan. Dan is the best. Um, also, follow Ori Fox on Twitter. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs>